Okay, hello again, Year 10. So a recap on yesterday's lesson. So which quotation from Sonnet 29 did we discuss? Which quotation from Love's Philosophy did we discuss? And how are these two poems similar in their theme today, not their structure? So today we're moving on to Robert Browning. Uh, we did Elizabeth Lafferson, Robert this one. Okay, so I'd like you to remind Matt as much as you can remember about him. This should be so easy because of everything that you learned about Elizabeth Lafferson. Uh, and can you please tell me what the name of his poem is from our collection? Okay then, so you should have named Porphyria's Lover, okay, and it's written by Robert Browning. So the things that you need to remember about this one was there was a strict class divide in the Victorian era between the rich upper classes and the lower classes. The two did not mix. Occasionally people from different classes would fall in love, which would lead to secret affairs, but they would never be openly together in society as it was frowned upon. So Robert Browning fell in love uh, with Elizabeth Barrett, but her father would not allow them to be together due to Elizabeth's higher social status. And eventually they ran off and got married, which we discussed last lesson. So again, using your inference ability, how does this picture relate to a quotation from the text? And can you explode that quotation? OK, then. So you should have uh, remembered the quotation gay feast. OK. And this emphasises the class difference between the speaker and his lover. He feels jealousy that she's got out without him, feels as though he's not good enough for her. There's also a hint of paranoia that we've spoken about previously. She could go to this feast and find someone of the same class who's more suited to her and the relationship would be much easier. And obviously we know that all this leads to him then killing her at the end of the text. So how does this image relate to the structure of the poem then? Okay. So the link I made between the picture was in the structure of the text. So at the beginning and the end of the poem, there's a, a mirror. So in the first half of the poem, Porphyria is the dominant lover. She put my arm around her waist. However, after the murder, the speaker is in control. I propped her head up. So he's objectified her and now he has full control of her. So we've spoken about that mirror imagery previously. Um, also, you can think about the regular rhyme scheme. So it continues throughout the poem. It could symbolise how regularly the speaker longs for Porphyria to be his forever. Uh, and obviously we have spoken about the regular rhythm. So it's iambic tetrameter. And it's the way that he sounds so calm and relaxed, which is quite disturbing considering that he's murdering Porphyria. Um, so maybe he believes it's the right thing to do to be with his lover forever. OK, then. So our second poem of this lesson is uh, Charlotte Mew. Um, and I'd like you to mind up as much as you can remember about her. And can you tell me the name of her poem, please? OK, then. So we should have had A Farmer's Bride uh, and it's by Charlotte Mew. OK, so the things to remember was obviously that the patriarchal society was still in place. Women were forced to marry whoever their father chose. Women were expected to obey their husbands. So Charlotte Mew was a feminist. She didn't agree with any of the treatment that we've just looked at previously. Um, Mew was also homosexual in a time when society didn't accept this. She lived a lonely life. She never married. Um, and that was basically her existence. OK, so she disagreed with the society that she lived in, but she couldn't really do much about it because she wasn't accepted as a person. OK, so how does this picture relate to one of the quotations from the poem, please? So what you should have written down is we chased her flying like a hare. So the noun hare symbolises how vulnerable and fragile the girl is. She's young and innocent and not ready for marriage. A hare is also a hunted animal, highlighting how oppressed and trapped she is in the marriage. We've also spoken about the pronoun of we, so it implies the whole of society was hunting down the bride, not just the farmer, because they believe she should obey her husband and not rebel. So obviously quite a lot of news views are in this. She felt like, you know, a child marrying a fully grown man wasn't acceptable. Um, and if they were to run away, they would just be brought back because that was how society worked. So um, a really important quotation, obviously, for thinking about this patriarchal society and how Mew was against it. How does this image relate to the structure of, of Charlotte Mew's poem then? So um, in terms of how I related this one to the image, it was more to do with the structure than it was to do with form. So I thought about the fact that it begins in the past tense. So three summers since I chose a maid. Uh, and it ends in the present tense, she sleeps up there. So it helps to portray the idea that nothing has or will ever change in the relationship and they're doomed to a dysfunctional and unhappy marriage and that's how it will stay. So even though they've been together for quite a while now, it, it's not changed yet and it's probably not going to change. Um, and the form is that it has an irregular rhyme scheme, which obviously is one of the first poems that we've looked at so far that has an irregular rhyme scheme. And it helps to portray the unpredictable nature of the girl who runs away and the, the irregular nature of their marriage. Okay. So 
finally then, how could you compare these poems?